And joining us now on the debate in London, Ontario, Patricia Allison. She's former professor of education from the newly named Western University. And with us here in studio, Chris Spence, director of education for the Toronto District School Board. Annie Kidder, executive director for People for Education. And Ruben Gastambide Fernandez, associate professor in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at OISI, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. That is too long a title. <laughs> we got to deal with that, Ruben, one yeah, of these days. Sure. Yes, indeed. Uh, good to see everybody around the table here, and of course to you too, Patricia, in London. I want to start just to set up our discussion here by reading something that was in the Globe and Mail a couple of weeks ago, and that'll set the table for the discussion to come. The demand for specialized programs is high across the country, with parents seeking cheaper alternatives to programs typically offered in private schools. The Toronto District School Board added nine elementary academies last month to its arsenal of 41 boutique schools, while Peel Region, one of Ontario's fastest growing boards, is looking at expanding its suite of specialized programs. Yet, in a school board north of Toronto, an arts program is faced with closing because some trustees say it is elitist and not the right fit for children of elementary school age. The arts program at Baythorne Public School in York Region has integrated a blend of dance, music and visual art with the Ontario curriculum for 25 years and the demand for entry remains high. However, the administration has raised concerns that grade 5 may be too early to specialize and the school's audition requirement means it's not equally accessible to all children. Okay, let's get into this. Annie, I'm going to kick it off to you first. I know you don't represent the York Region School Board. No, I don't. You don't speak for the York Region School Board. You don't live in York Region. All of the above. Having said that, from what you know about what they've got planned up there, why are they getting rid of this? And again, it is really important. I don't know enough about this specific school, this specific program. Well, why are you discussing getting rid of this? Why I think when they looked at, the, they're looking at a lot of programs, I think, in, in that board, um, and as our boards all across the country at various times, and they went, we have to make sure that we have a system that's equitable, that um, all kids have access to the kinds of programs that they need, and that we have to be careful about uh, programs that may end up kind of dividing kids up rather than bringing them together so that this program partly because there are audition requirements but partly as a specialized program uh, may uh, divide kids um, and I think the concern is along kind of socioeconomic lines or even along just you know which kids pass the audition and which kids don't. Patricia Allison do those arguments hold any sway for you? Mm, I'm afraid you can't have it both ways if you're, going to, uh, if you're going to try and give all children what they need and provide them with the kind of specialized programming that they might require, then you can't have everybody getting the same opportunities. It's simply not going to work. You can't have it both ways. Rubain, what's the idea behind these programs in the first place? Well, I think part of the idea is certainly to provide students <coughs> with what they need in terms of learning and teaching. Uh, but I think oftentimes the, the, the crux of the debates has to do with the fact that not everybody who needs a particular program has access to it because of the fact that most specialized uh, programs uh, have a process for exclusion, right? Anytime that you have a process of selection, that means that on some criteria, which oftentimes is, is tied to all kinds of values, social cultural values, uh, so some criteria is used to keep some students out. And oftentimes that produces the kind of elitist accusation that uh, many of these programs often receive. Because surely, uh, you know, we know that lots of different kinds of learners need different kinds of things. The question is, how do we make sure that all learners receive the kinds of teaching and learning that they receive, and, and not just some learners receive that kind of specialization? Chris Pence, you are uh, presumably a big booster of this, given that your school board offers many of, many of these kinds of niche programs. What about the arguments that you've heard so far that in some respects they're inequitable by just offering them. Well, I think it's a concern, and, but I think it's a concern that can be addressed, and I'm not sure that the solution is to you know, get rid of the program. I think it, you take a look at how you uh, provide that kind of equitable access across your district. And I think that's one of the things I'm proud about uh, you know, that we're doing with these new elementary programs. We took a look at where they were going to be uh, uh, housed, and uh, when you take a look at our, our Learning Opportunities Index, which really talks about you know, external uh, factors that impact student learning. And, you know, so we have this uh, scale and we use that to uh, apply uh, to schools and to take a look at how we can allocate resources and programs and opportunities in a way that will level the playing field. 
And you know, these nine academies, over half of them are gonna be in schools that range um, you know, anywhere from uh, number three on our LOI to, to, to 97. LOI? LOI, Learning Opportunities Index, okay. which helps us to determine uh, external pressures that schools have. But if I look at that equity issue a little more, Annie, you know, I, I've seen the map of where the Toronto District School Board offers its special academy programs. Mm -hmm. There's not too many in central or northern Etobicoke. There's not that many, proportionally, it seems, in, you know, in the outer reaches of Scarborough. So and, and do, they, do the parents have an argument here? I'm not even sure if it's, it's, if it's where they are. I think that you have to kind of take a step back even before that and look at, at the evidence from other systems about what happens when you have a system that's based on choice and specialty schools. And Doug Wilms, a Canadian's looked at it, the English have looked at it, um, there's been a study on Edmonton schools that have looked at it. And, and from the evidence that's there now, um, you start to see divisions along socioeconomic lines. So you may have a school in what you know could be a, a, a low income neighborhood, but but that when you have a system of choice like that, the people who tend to choose are those with the capacity to choose. So I know how to work the system, I know how to get my kid in, I know how to, to make the system work for my particular child, and we do have particular children. I mean, that is the hard part, is that we all of our children are very, very different. They have different interests, different skills, different capacities, different everythings. And so the hard part is how do you make one education system work for all those kids but how do you make sure that you're not undermining one of those goals of education and it's a very hard balance between what I want as an individual parent and what we want as a society how do you make sure that you're not creating more divisions in fact by keeping all those kids in separate schools that's a great question Patricia can I ask you to kind of chew on that question a bit there that is a really tough balance to mm -hmm. find between what my kid needs but what we as a society design to and, educate and all of our children. And even whether your kid needs it is or, even a right. bit lower. Needs versus what I want yeah, maybe yeah. for the kid. Okay, yeah, T tackle that if you would, Patricia. I think there's two points there. Uh, I think uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased to hear Chris say that they're trying to tackle this problem of access because I think that really is the problem. Uh, if, you, if you have the choice of running the programs or not running the programs, then obviously if we really honestly believe that we want to meet the needs of all children, then you are going to run those programs. But then to make them truly accessible to all children is much more difficult. And then you do get the, the point, as Annie points out, that yes, some people, some parents, will simply have more resources to be able to work the system than others. So again, it becomes a, a difficulty of First of all, ensuring that access really is equitable across the system, and that's very difficult. But we also have to decide what our policy priorities are. Are we really um, interested in making choices available to parents, as well as trying to do what's, what we think is best for all children? The, there is an argument to be made that parents do have some, um, some right to some choice in, in what their children get as an education. Uh, okay, Ruben, tackle this for me if you would. It, take a step back. Is it a good idea, in theory, to have one school system publicly funded, mm -hmm. but that offers many different kinds of programs within that system to different kinds of kids? Well, I mean, I think one of the arguments, and, and having spent quite a bit of time in, in schools uh, that have specialized programs, uh, one of the very strong arguments that I see that it often it's actually not made about uh, specialized programs is that both the students, the teachers, and the parents who gravitate to programs are people who are committed to a particular kind of vision. And that kind of commitment usually translates into a great deal of innovation. So one of the things that is really exciting about these kinds of programs, and why one might argue, yes, that is a, a good idea, is that it promotes innovation because it promotes a kind of commitment to a very specific vision of schooling. So if you have a, specific, a, a vision of schooling that is about how do we teach math, science, and English through dance and, and music and visual art, it means that everybody is invested and everybody uh, is really committed to innovating and to creating new ways of learning and to tackling the challenges that the system presents. Of course, the question is, well, in a, in a, in a city as big as Toronto, how do we make sure that in every place uh, around the city, people have access to those kinds of programs? And mm -hmm. that's really hard. 
because you know we live in a country that spends more money in the military than it does on schooling. So if instead <laughs> we spend more money on schooling, then maybe there would be more access to those kinds of programs. And people locally could decide what kinds of programs they want to have in their schools and could be much more invested in, 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 in innovating, in developing new programs, in, uh, and, and in developing the things that communities want and need. Every school should have an arts integrated program, right? The question here is not, is arts integration yeah. a bad thing? The question is, how do we ensure that everybody right. has access and that everybody is able to benefit from that kind of innovation? Well, and the, and if I could just add yeah. one thing to that, then how do we also make sure that kids don't suffer who happen to have parents who aren't necessarily that interested, let's put it that way, who just, you know, they want their kids to go to school, but they don't want to have to care that much, but they, they want to just be able to assume the school works. Uh, and that leads me to where I wanted to go with you, Chris, mm -hmm. which is, does the director of the Toronto School Board know how much parental gaming of the system goes on out there in order that their children can go to these fancier academies, for lack of a better expression? Well, I hear stories, but but uh, <laughs> do you know do you I, I mean, stories? <laughs> well, I, I mean that's all they really are is is, is you know stories. But um, you, I mean I think there's a, certainly an element of, of of truth to that that there are parents out there that are really engaged and will do whatever it takes to get their sons and daughters in uh, the places that they think are going to be best uh, uh, for their uh, development. But I, I mean I, I go from the approach that you know pr perhaps the biggest issue facing us isn't necessarily underachievement. Uh, it's disengagement, and and we see this as a way to further engage our kids. I, when I look at back on my uh, educational background and and uh, you know what sport did for me and, and providing that opportunity, uh, that kept me going to school. That kept me engaged. So I think we got to circle back because I think these are all real challenges that we're dealing with. But right now we're working on a K to 12 accommodation and program strategy to ensure all kids get e equitable access to these kinds of programs can because I, it, it should be about the kid. Can I use another? It's turned into a bit of a swear word here. It also starts with E. It's not equitable. The word is elitist. Mm -hmm. Everybody, not everybody, a lot of people throw that word around. Right. It's almost a profanity nowadays to say what these academies do is an elitist thing within what is supposed to be an egalitarian public school system. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Uh, again, I, I mean, I, I, I don't accept that. Uh, I, I, I've certainly, you know, heard it. And, I, and again, I, I think if you take a look at what we're doing with our uh, elementary academies. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, admission requirements. Uh, it's just a passion for learning. So you got kids who love to sing. Why not provide them an opportunity to sing and infuse that into their daily uh, school experience? Because the research will say when they do get involved, their parents are much more likely to get involved. And again, I think it's about the the, the equitable access uh, to these programs. And again, I'm I'm really proud of the fact that some of these. Uh, academies are being located in communities that may not typically uh, access them if they were on the other side of the city or in a different uh, uh, area of the city where they have to commute to. So, and I think that's part of the challenge because, as you know, w w I think all would agree, um, there's there's a whole lot to be said about uh, you know arts and and, and music uh, opportunities and and how that really helps uh, children's disposition to learn. Well, let me ask Patricia on that. Do you think that these academies are? A, elitist, and B, if so, is that a bad thing? I think elite has become a bad word, and I think it's a bad label to put on what's essentially a good idea. I agree with, with Chris that this is a way to engage children in their own learning, to, to encourage them in learning. And if, if you throw a bad word like elite on it, I think you're losing track of what's really happening, which is recognizing differences and recognizing that some children need to have their education approached from a different angle. How did elite so, get to be such a dirty word, Patricia? <laughs> <laughs> because it's misused, like most words that become <laughs> dirty. <laughs> How about I, I think you know, we don't really have a problem with elites in our society. We just don't call them that. You know, we don't expect everybody to be able to act on the stage at Stratford. Or we don't expect everybody to be able to play in the NHL. But, but we, don't, we don't crow about that being elitism, and yet it is. It's simply selection, well, which if, is normal. Well, if, if we're using that scale, there's only one elite athlete here today, and I think he might have played for the British Columbia Lions <laughs> once upon a time, and that'd be this guy sitting to my right. Anyway, well, I think elitism. I think it's naive to to uh, assume that there isn't a problem with the way that elites have been perpetuated in the society that we live in, and part of the reason why elites has become kind of a dirty world is that 
uh, the reward is that people have smartened up and realized that the terms of engagement by which those who are supposed to be elite get identified have been kind of dismantled by the sociology of education for 40 years. We know that meritocracy doesn't work. We know that those who have access to resources get to their children more resources regardless of how smart they are. And we know, you know, I can mention a few examples from the country to the south of the border that you can become president without being particularly smart. So Name names. Well, uh, <laughs> well uh, my citizenship might be at stake. So. <laughs> Uh, I, think that, I think that people have smartened up and realized that th th you know, those who claim to be elite and claim to belong to those circles have no basis for that claim. So that's why the, the term elitist has become uh, under scrutiny. And, and I think it also is a bit naive to think that, uh, that, the, that, we, shouldn't, that we should dismiss the elitist argument in relationship to specialized schools because of the history of the schools. The fact is that for the most part, when there have been specialized programs over the last 20 years, the people who get the most advantage of those programs are the people who are already well served by the system yeah. hmm. and the people who have the most resources. That is the history of those programs and we can't ignore that. And we also can't ignore the yeah. fact that, for example, in relationship to specialized arts programs, oftentimes the kind of cultural practices that get taught in those contexts are the, 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 the cultural practices of the elite, the ones associated with white European traditions. Does that have to be that way? No, it doesn't have to be that way. And I can think of lots of places where I've been where there are specialized arts programs where the cultural practices being taught have nothing to do with elitism. Okay, right? but tell me this though. If you're a, what did you say, white European, what was the expression you used? White I used Europe, a sort of white European establishment. Establishment, right? okay. If, but, but you can't act your way out of a paper bag or you're the offspring of parents from Latin America and mm -hmm. you have a wonderfully spirited personality and you can act your way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. Isn't that second kid going to get into one of those so-called elite Not academies? necessarily, because if the child of Latin American immigrants is too busy working to take act acting lessons, the, the uh -huh. chances that they'll be able to demonstrate yeah. that they can act their way out of paperback are pretty slim in comparison to somebody who has well, been taking acting so lessons for 10 have years. have the folks right. in York region found... Uh, well, I, I think that... Maybe what this is a problem. It, well, no, I think I definitely think it's a problem. And that what we, ha we have to care about two things. We have to care about kids who end up being kind of doubly advantaged, my kids, who come from, you know, fairly well-off homes with a lot of sort of cultural stuff going on that then can go to schools with more of that than other kids. But we also have to be careful, I think, in education. And again, it's, it's hard because you have to balance what I, my, you know, fierce desire as a parent uh, with the fairness of the overall system. But we also have to be careful about evidence. And we have to really look at and think about before we just willy-nilly do what small groups ask for, and often those small groups with the loudest voices, again, tend to be more privileged than other groups. We have to actually think in education, because they're kids we're experimenting with, about what, what the evidence shows work. So I think there's a ton of evidence about the arts. I think there's a ton of evidence about health and phys ed, too, about the importance. It's part of why it's difficult, because we're kind of operating without a, a big picture of what, how we define success in education. But those programs, beyond <laughs> sort of reading, writing, and math, are incredibly important to kids' engagement, all kids' engagement, whether or not you want to be an actor or an athlete. They're actually part of learning who you are. They're part of experiencing life. So we have to be careful, A, we don't hive that off, but that B, we look at evidence and go, here's what really makes a difference to kids. And you then you have to adjust in terms of, you know, which kids you're teaching at that moment. That's what teachers are supposed to do. But to start to just chunk up the sy system into a bunch of specialty schools, some of which, for which, you know, we have now schools for boys. Really, the evidence is girls do better without boys, but boys don't do better without That's girls. Right. You know, so we have to watch that and look at the research. I, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I agree. You know, but so that we, we, we have to be careful about the decisions we make and that they're not based on some kind of instinct that, you know, we're going to well, like let, this. Let me follow up on that with this. And, uh, Michael, I'm in the middle of page two now. Can we bring up that list? Chris, I'm going to go to you with this next because okay. the Toronto District School Board does have... Uh, many alternative elementary schools out there with, um, you know, with an eye towards providing within a publicly funded school system uh, some alternatives. And here they come, you know, Afrocentric Alternative School, Alpha 2, Alpha Alternative, Avondale, Beaches, and the list goes on. There are many um, throughout the course of the 416. And, uh, you know, as we see this thing scroll through, Chris, maybe you could tell us what are the benefits of having so many different programs within a single school system? Well, I think it's a signal. Uh, I think it's a signal to our, our students, our community, um, that not all students learn the same way. One size doesn't fit all. 
and uh, there's a whole lot of evidence around the, 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 the fact that uh, students lear don't learn the same way or at the same rate, and how do we provide opportunities to ensure that all students are going to be engaged uh, in, in our system. When you've got 550 schools, I just don't think they all have to be the same. I really don't. Sameness is not synonymous with, with, with excellence. So, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, when you take a look at uh, parent engagement, uh, which continues to be a challenge for us, we know that, that one of the things uh, is when, when parents have choice uh, in, you know, working with their sons and daughters, they're more inclined to be uh, engaged in the school. And that's uh, a concern for us, and that's something that we also want to try to address. These uh, alternative academies, are they more expensive for the Toronto Board to run? No. Not at all, because the, the funding follows the students. And, and we'll see. I mean, you know, we're, we're now into uh, the second week, and we've got over 120 uh, kids that have signed up for the academies, and uh, about 20% of them are from uh, out of board. So, um, out no, of board meaning? Not, not within the TDSB, so mm -hmm. from, you know, uh, independent uh, uh, schools outside, or, oh, uh, or, they, or what have you. Do they live outside the city? Uh, not necessarily outside yeah. of the city, but they're not with the Toronto District School oh, Board. I see. Do, do parents have to pay more to send their children to these alternative no, schools? No, absolutely you know, not. It's all part of the... All, all part of it. And, it. and as I said, the funding follows the students. So in many ways, you know, you, you only get the opportunity to run this if there's uh, parent interest, if there's student interest. Okay, let me raise another issue here. Patricia, I'm going to get you to talk about this first, mm -hmm. then we'll go around on this. Is it a problem that potentially the best teachers who are the most creative and the most into alternative education the most creative students who are the best horn players or the best actors, the next Catherine Hepburns, Marlon Brando's, Meryl Streep's, whatever. Is it a problem that because of these alternatives being offered, they get f funneled, for lack of a better word, into these alternative slash elite academies, taking that talent away from the rest of the public school system? Is that an issue? Patricia, you first. Well, a problem for whom? For the um, other schools, obviously. <laughs> But it's not a problem for the children who are getting the specialized education that's going to benefit them. So what so, do we care more about here? Well, that's, that is a, an issue, isn't it? Um, obviously, taking, taking them out of the, the rest of the school system is going to remove something. Um, on the other hand, so does taking out, for example, children who need special education and have to, have to be taken to a, a, another facility just because we can't do everything in one building. Uh, we know that, we accept that. And we also know that we probably would, there would probably be benefits, there definitely would be benefits from keeping them all in the same building. But we also know that keeping them all in the same building will mean that we cannot give them all the programming that they require. Hmm. So yes, of course, overall, on average, there will be some benefit to keeping everybody together. But a lot of children are going to have to pay a fairly steep price for that. Re um, and Rebain, is that worth it? One of the arguments we hear about not having a two-tier health care system in Canada is that the best doctors, the biggest right. money givers will all go to that, you know, upper system, leaving the rest of the public system less well off. Well, I think, Can you I make think, the same argument here? Well, I think we have to be really careful that we don't make the assumption that because we call these programs boutique, then that means that all the creative students and all the passionate teachers go there. That's just not true, right? There are lots of really creative students, really passionate teachers working in all kinds of schools, and we have to be really careful that we don't, that we don't reproduce that assumption that just because there's a specialized program, that, that, that's, that's what it that means. It looks that way. Well, it looks, it, when you call something yeah. the Etobicoke School for the Arts, it sounds well, like it it's got it more cachet than It looks than that way, else. but it also looks that way because of the kinds of opportunities available. You know, when, when, when Chris makes reference to the idea that everybody pays the same, well, the fact is that they don't. The fact is that there are, there's more money available in context with their specialized programs because parents are more invested and therefore raise more money, right? I mean, uh, Anis Group has done a great deal of work around comparing the kind of, uh, the kind of funding that parents in certain schools can raise. And that's because parents pay more money when they go to specialized programs in order to support the programming. So there's a, there's a difference. So, so we need to keep in mind that what might seem like more innovation uh, is perhaps attached to the fact that there's more resources. If we give more resources to other schools, maybe the students who are creative and the teachers who are, co who are passionate in any every other school would look just as like the same way because they'd be able to be as uh, innovative and as committed to their education because their resources are available. So we need to be really careful mm -hmm. that we don't the, ma the, make that sort of elision there. There is a sense, Annie, you tell me if I'm exaggerating this, but I think there's a sense uh, you know, among a lot of people that if you send your kid to the Ro you know, Rosedale School for the Arts, it's almost like sending them to private school for free. Fair? 
A little bit. I mean, I'm not sure if the sense is it's almost like sending them to private school, but it means that you can kind of, you're a little bit more in control of, you know, it's the atmosphere I want, it's the choices I make, it's the things that I care about in the school. And I think that the hard part is, when you, again, when you look at the evidence, the evidence is that kids who, who are going to do well and kids from a higher socioeconomic bracket are going to do well pretty well wherever. Regardless. And but when you start to take those kids out and when you start to have schools where where they're where how can I do can I put this the other way? Kids who are from a lower socioeconomic status or who may be more likely to struggle in school do better in schools where that in schools with a mixture of kids. They do much worse when you take those kids out. And then the kids you're taking out are the kids who are more likely to do fine no matter where they are anyway. I'm not making this argument very well. Um, but I think it's a very important argument that we not disadvantage anybody by taking out. And they're not necessarily the those kids either, the elites, they're not necessarily going to be Merrill Streep either, but again, they have a lot of advantages. They have parents who are already very engaged. To our, I mean, as Chris says, he's exactly right. The parents who are making those choices are more likely to be engaged. But just because my parents don't happen to be wanting to make choices, do I? Should I be disadvantaged by that? I think no. We have to make sure again, and this goes back to the the hard and terrible balance between you know personal choice and 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 government really. You know, how do we make sure that we're really looking Looking at equity, that we're really making sure we have an education system that's fair, that gives every single kid in it an equitable chance for success, whether they've got, you know, mummy and daddy who are all artsy and have money, or mummy and daddy who are mummy and mummy or whoever their parents are who are really struggling or don't care that much about school. We still want that kid to have a chance. Right. And, okay, and, Chris. And you know what? Lots I, to unpack I, there. Go yeah, for it. Yeah, and I and I absolutely agree. And I think one of the, the challenges is having a shared understanding of what equity is equal access to the benefits the system has to offer, but that may require differentiated treatment. And that's where people get a little bit, you know, hung up, because people would like to see everybody get the same thing. But you know what? Everyone's not the same, and equity is about giving what, what, what students need. And, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the programs that we're trying to uh, uh, unfold here provides that opportunity, because we're trying to level the playing field. You know, and you go back to, you know, what's good for kids? Um, how is this going to benefit kids? And I, and I think, you know, uh, you know, arts, music, all of those opportunities infused in the curriculum, research is clear that it's good for kids. So now, how do you scale that up to provide equitable opportunities uh, throughout the district? She's but having the, a connection. I'm, I'm having a fit. I'm yeah. only having a fit yeah. because the evidence is also pretty clear, I think, that when you have a system of specialty schools and choice, it doesn't level the playing field. It actually does the opposite. So, and again, maybe there's some magical way but, we but, haven't but, discovered yet of we, making we, it fair. But, but, but Annie, we know that now. So now that we know that, I think that we can... Now we that can, we know it, we're doing we, it anyway, no, though. Now that we know it, that we're, we're trying to create a system in which still provides the opportunity opportunity but addresses those issues because I, I'm not I'm not gonna argue with that I think there's there's a lot to be said but what does that mean don't do it at all I, and, and I'm yeah. thinking I'm well, thinking that well, hang you, on you, I think we got is that what you mean <laughs> oh, yeah I think don't so I think yes because I think different, we're we have different. to we have to we have to deal with the difference among kids without dividing them up so we have to look at our classrooms and go what are we doing in our classrooms whether I'm going to the school down the street or I'm choosing a specialty school because we don't want to differentiate in that way to the disadvantage of the school down so the street. So you would shut these down, these programs? I wouldn't put all my, you know, eggs in that basket. I wouldn't be investing them and I wouldn't, be, I would be thinking so hard first before because I think this is a, you can, more and more people are going to want them. It's a, it grows and it will divide the system more and it's, you know, based on competing with other boards. But, Sorry. But, Go ahead. But, 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 I think there's a middle ground here, and I think I, I think I'm one sure of the things Ruben and then Chris. One, one, one of the things that uh, oftentimes don't doesn't get addressed, and and one of the things that we're trying to examine through our research is: Do specialized programs have a responsibility to the rest of the system that is larger than other schools by virtue of the fact that they have more resources and more focus? So what would that mean if if every time that we establish a specialized programs, we say, you are you have a specialized programs, you have the right to pick the students, but you also have a responsibility to the board that funds you. You have a responsibility to the people. That mean? You. So that means that these might, might become hubs for research, for example. Mm -hmm. It might mean that, it, that, that there are places where teachers can come to receive professional development. Yeah. It might mean that there become places where uh, that, that, that don't admit 
students uh, on the basis of admission, but that they're run through lottery, so that anybody yeah. you know, has, a, has a chance to go. It might mean that we set them up in the four quadrants of the district to make sure that every teacher and every student in every quadrant has access to the information that is generated but, and to the but, innovations that are but, developed, but, right? And that's what we're doing, and, that, and that's what I'm saying. That, that, that goes back to, okay, what's good for kids? So I think there's a, a shared understanding that these kind of opportunities are good for kids. Not all kids, but some of the kids. And our commitment is to the whole system, learning for all, ensuring all kids are going to get what they need to be successful. Well, that means equity has to stay in the, in the, in the center, yeah. right? And part of the problem with specialized programs is that they become, their specialty becomes the focus, not equity. So mm -hmm. that can happen. And I, think, and I think we need to hold the, the schools accountable and see where that goes to make sure that a commitment to equity remains as important as the commitment to the And to equity the isn't just about geography. But, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think right. a really good example, because I absolutely support community schools. And, uh, you know, we've got hundreds of community schools in our system that are doing excellent work. Um, but, but, you know, here we are in 2012, and there continues to be some, some, some challenges in terms of engagement, in terms of outcomes for, for kids. And, and so what you want to do is to, you want to continue to explore how to, you know, reach out to, 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 more, to more kids. And, and that's part of what we're trying to do. It goes back to me for engagement. How do we further engage some of these kids? Because it's really clear to me that, you know, as kids work their way through the system, they become more and more uh, disengaged. So this is hopefully an opportunity to further engage the kids well. As can well. we do one specific example? I guess a few years ago there was a heck of a debate in Toronto about whether or not to open up a uh, Afrocentric curriculum right. school. Right. Okay, so you guys, uh, you know, you yeah. took the criticism, you, you did it anyway. What's the verdict so far? I would say so far so good. Uh, but, but even go back further to the uh, First Nation school that we have, the LGBTQ uh, triangle program that we have. Ideally, you'd love all those kids to be served at their local school. But guess what? 2012, not happening. So what do you do? You got to constantly find different ways to meet their needs. You got the community who comes to you and says, listen, there is an alarming failure rate of the kids in our community. We would like to explore an Afrocentric school. I think we have to take a look at it. You know, just by the fact that these kids aren't getting the kind of outcomes that they should be getting, that other kids throughout the system are getting. Patricia, you've very patiently been uh, listening along, and now it's your turn to weigh in on this. Go ahead. Well, I did get a little steamy around the ears. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I hear is a conflict between, between horizontal equity and vertical equity. You know, horizontal equity says that everybody's got to be treated the same and have the same opportunities, and vertical equity is saying that no everybody is different and needs to be treated differently and the problem is you can't do both things at once and you have to try and balance the two different things uh, and I think the the problem of integrating specialized programs is really um, a more difficult one than it looked on the surface trying to find a way to integrate them into the system so that they they are opportunities for all students but also that they give back to the system in some way that's helpful to the rest of the system. And, and that, I think, is just what you've been talking about. I think that, that, that's the, the essential dilemma that public school systems are having right now. Um, as Chris said, one size does not fit all. Uh, but how do you make that work? Well, let me get you to weigh in, though, on the, the, I guess, most significant area of disagreement we've had on the discussion so far, which is, on the one hand, Chris says we've got to try new things. We want to engage people. And he says, on the other hand, you've got some equity problems here, making sure that it's fairly accessible to everyone and that we're not doing that necessarily as well as we could be in which uh, case no. we may want to shut them down so what do you say well no I, I don't agree that you should shut them down uh, ironically I think that um, entry by audition is probably a step in the right direction for making sure that access is uh, open can you explain what that but, means well it seems to me that the the child from from a, a less privileged family who has talent is more likely to get into the, the specialized program by audition than, than uh, if the whole entry uh, admission was set up entirely through influence and parental choice. And the, the kid whose parents are probably not terribly interested might stand far more chance of getting in by audition. So I think you, if you maintain the audition rather than the, the complete free op open access, you're actually helping with the equity, and that's a bit of an irony because it doesn't sound that way. Okay, um, we but got I think it does. We got Western versus Oise now because <laughs> well, Ruben doesn't just, agree. It just, it just doesn't work that way. I've sat, I've sat through hundreds of auditions at specialized programs, and the fact of the matter is that when we talk about intangibles like talent, passion, mm -hmm. commitment, 
what we're doing is basically project on projecting our own social cultural values onto the people that we're watching. Mm -hmm. And, and if the people that we're watching are not consistent with them, we end up choosing them. Uh, or Absolutely. we end up uh, eliminating them. But so it actually has really yeah. nothing to do with but you some can, universal uh, notion of what talent means. Can't you objectively well, tell when one student sings process. better than another? Uh, well, it depends on what they're singing, actually. Uh, believe well, it or not, it depends point. on what they're singing. And singing. it depends on what they're singing. It depends on what they walk into the room with uh, as a way to accompany their singing. So somebody walks in with an accompanist, or they're walking with a boombox. So in our academies, you know, there's no admission requirements. And if but there it, is in it, the high school. It, it, so, yeah, yeah, and that's straight across the board. But um, if you know, if the capacity gets to a certain uh, uh, level, then it's by lottery. Right. I mean, so all we're seeing is kids who have a passion to sing, kids who maybe have a passion for sport and wellness, and that to me is going to help to further engage some kids, not all, but some. Hmm. What should we do about this, Ruben? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I think I think that we shouldn't uh, simply eliminate what what have proven to be places where, like I was saying before, commitment and innovation so happen. You, so York so, Region's idea to potentially get rid of this program because of their concerns over equity and so forth, uh, not the right way to go. Well, I think well, I think they should get rid of they should probably get rid of the admission requirement for mm. fourth graders, right? I mean, it mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense to that nobody can make a case that you can tell when that child is going to become an actor when they're in fourth grade. There's just no, it, it just doesn't stand scrutiny mm. of, of empirical scrutiny. Mm. So it doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, I, so I think that needs to be that needs to be examined carefully. How the how the and, and the idea of lotteries is probably uh, worth worth considering further. Should it be thrown out. You know, I think it has a lot to do with how can a board the size of say York or the size of say the TDSB, how can a board that size ensure that the kinds of innovations that happen in those places spread mm -hmm. throughout the board? That's a big challenge, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that having specialized programs geographically distributed can accomplish that. That's a question for me. To, to what extent can uh, can that program really benefit the entire system? I, I'm, I'm kind of go back and forth. But that would be a reason for me to keep them. If, Is this challenge so big mm -hmm. that any we have no choice but to say, we can't do it fairly, we can't do it properly, so let's not do it? No, I think that, I think first of all, we have to remember this is actually TV Ontario and not just Toronto, and mm -hmm. so that we can't be saying surely that uh, only people, kids who live in cities are going to get these mm -hmm. chances, mm -hmm. uh, because if you happen to live in a very small town, you have one school. Right. Um, so we really, really have to care about every single school. We also have to care, I think, that we're not letting pressure off the system by hiving off schools, by saying we're going to have some art specialty schools or sports or whatever, um, and then it sort of allows us not to to look at the importance of those programs to all kids. I don't think it's a matter of you know saying let's throw it all out, but I do think that these days that we're having a bit of a tendency out of fear, out of desire to compete, out of a sense of kind of buy-in to the sort of uh, kind of corporate model for you know for that kind of uh, choice and competition, that we're we're doing something without thinking about it hard enough first. So it's not necessarily saying get rid of them all. It's saying let's really make sure we've thought of we've looked at all of the evidence, we've thought of all of the ramifications of this. We've looked at each of our schools to make sure that we're dealing with the difference in those local schools and that we're not just moving towards something that's going to have a consequence than, wor than, than is worse than what we have right now. Because right now we do have uh, kids with, you know, we have have and have not schools already and we have kids that are come into schools much more advantaged mm -hmm. than other kids. And we have to care about that. Look at our society, you know, it, mm -hmm. it mirrors the, the, the inequity in our society mm -hmm. and schools should actually be doing the opposite of that. Okay. We've got about a minute left here and as much as I've enjoyed this discussion about education, did you all see the Super Bowl yesterday? Yes. Yeah, that was. Yes. That was some game. Now, you know, my, my only concern on this program is that, you know, I just wish we had somebody around the table who played professional football who would have a good comment to make about it. Oh, wait a second here. Chris, didn't you play professional football I, once upon a time? I did. I did. Now, that's what I thought. What did you think of that football game yesterday? Great game. And, and you know which what? Which side were you on? Giants. Oh, good. Okay. What we agree on that. Defense wins championships. Yes, it does, doesn't and it? And Giants proved it again. They were fantastic. <laughs> they were. When did you play? Uh, mid 80s for BC Lions. BC Lions, yeah. Were you up for more than a cup of coffee? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a, it was a cup of coffee, but not much more. Yeah, not much more. It was a, a brief career, and I and I always say I'm 
I think I'm a better educator than I was football player. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the kids hope so. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's good of all of you to join us for this discussion tonight. Patricia Allison, the retired University of Western, oops, I can't say anymore, the retired Western University professor, thanks for joining us on the line from London. Chris Spence, the Director of Education for the Toronto District School Board. Annie Kidder, People for Education. Ruben Gastambide Fernandez at OISE on the other side of the table. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.